First time? Yeah. I don't even really feel like I should be here. Oh, you sound like me two years ago. All right, come on in, everybody. Welcome. We're all here because we feel different. Because we feel ashamed. We're here because there are people in our lives that make us feel bad just because of the kind of music we like. Would anybody like to share? I'll go. I was uh, at the mall with my son and he wanted to go into the record store. So we go in and he's picking through the classic rock, Led Zeppelin, those kind of bands. Mm -hmm. And then I see it. I mean, it's, it's sitting there in a crate in the corner. It was a 1979 first pressing of Baby Beluga. No. Truth. Baby Beluga's True. no baby Good. shark. Glenn, please. Raffi? Yeah. At least Raffi plays an instrument. Guys, every week. Right. Every week. Right. I'm sorry. But, but the, the guy behind the counter, he's all like, you know, is this for your kid? Or do you have a little one on the way? And I'm like, no, sir, this is for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a, I'm a 55-year-old man. I'm a taxpayer, and I happen to like music that was written for children. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Great job, Bob. Let's all say the affirmation together. We love, we love children's, children's music. music. And that's okay. okay. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, I can go. I'm Nadia. I'm hey, new. Nadia. <laughs> Welcome to the group, Nadia. The other night, I was in a car with some friends. We were going out for the night. Normally, I wouldn't even think about plugging in my phone in the car. Yeah. But my battery was low. So it was already plugged in when someone asked me to put on some music. And did you? I, I panicked. I, I, I thought I'd say, uh, my phone doesn't do music, but that doesn't make sense. I just hit play. The wheels on the bus go round and round. Round and round. Round and round. round, and, round. And, and how did your friends react? They laughed. They said, oh, hey, what happened? Did your nephew get a hold of your phone? <laughs> I said, no, I don't have a nephew. I don't even like kids. But this song, I'm, it was written for kids, but not just for kids. No, no. Like that the wheels on the bus go round and round, and it's deep. You know, it, it's about everything. It's about life. Sorry, I probably sound stupid saying that. No, not at all. We've all been there, Nadia. In fact, this reminds me of a song I love. Maybe you've heard of it. It's about this itsy bitsy spider. And, and this spider, he, he just goes up this water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. That's it. What do you think that spider did, Nadia? What did it do next? The itsy bitsy spider went up the spout again. That's right. Wonderful work. Awesome progress, everybody. Oh. Corey in the Wong Notes. I'm Corey Wong. Today's theme is criticism. Being an artist, you're always going to get critiques. Some are nice with solid suggestions. Others are ranty and can reveal the critic's personal issues. But I believe you can learn something in every critique. For example, here are some critiques from our YouTube comment section. Okay, just last week, Music Diva 2000 says, great music, Great sketches. It'd be cool if there were more stories about the band members. That's a nice note. That's, okay. That's an easy critique. And you know what? I love the band, and we all know Sonny's got some stories. Maybe we uh, change up the episode structure a little bit and let the band shine a little bit more. 
This particular cat is commenting on probably every video. There was at least six or seven comments from this guy on the Stevie oh. Wonder medley. You know what I'm talking What'd about. That do? <laughs> <laughs> so, Saxy Daddy Sam suggests, Corey talks so fast that his voice sounds like rapid fire farts. Corey should jump off a cliff. And please, less tenor sax and more Barry sax solos. What? Like, wh just pick one, pick one thing to go off. Like, this guy's just coming at me personally. He's coming at my music. He's coming at the arrangements. Like, what's, what's going on? That's hurtful. Mostly because I'm afraid of heights and cliffs. And sure, I talk fast. It helps me get through the monologue because I do a full monologue for every show and I don't like these cards. I memorize that, which is probably why I'm so tired all the time. And, you know, it's just like. That last comment kind of has a point. Whose? I don't remember his name. Saxy Daddy Sam? Uh, oh, was that it? Uh, oh, oh, hold up. Yo, hold up. Come on. Are you Saxy Daddy no, 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 Sam? No, no, no. This cat thinks he's going to get more Barry Sax solos by commenting on our YouTube? You think that's how you're going to get more Barry Sax solos? I thought I was Michael, I don't want a single Barry Sax solo on next year. He's out! Bye! Bye! <laughs> Bye. Peace! Ah! 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 Criticism is important to be able to take. It's a lesson we could all learn. So, I invited a special guest to help us. Please welcome therapist and peer mediator, Dr. Phyllis Woodley. Band, let's circle up. All right. I'm in stereo. <laughs> Sam, you brought your sax? That's good, because it might be the last time we see Barry Sax on this stage. <laughs> I came from a school of negative reinforcement. Some of my mentors, Michael Bland, Sonny T, if somebody was messing up on stage, they'd say, flat, or they'd get the bye on stage at Bunkers. The way I just told Sammy it might be the last time that we see Barry Sachs on stage was kind of my way of saying, Sam, let's step up your game. Let's see if you can be a team player. And we can move on from there. How do you think that works as far as communicating to the band members? Well, you know, as you always say, you know, you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. So mm. instead of saying, bye, dude, or we're not going to use your instrument anymore, you have to reshape how you phrase things. What would be a good way that I could tell Sam quit being a jerk on the internet, trying to sabotage the comment thread, trying to sabotage real critiques for the band. Well, maybe he doesn't feel a part of the group. Somewhere along the way, he's been hurt by someone. Ooh. Deep pain. It may go back as far as childhood. But we have to show him love and understanding. Give him constructive criticism. Not tell him so much about what not to do, but share with him what he should do. Mm. Positive reinforcement. Mm. You know, I've had some other people in the band tell me that they have some grievances with other band members. I would like to see if we can try to figure out how to squash some of the beef that some of the band members have with each other. Do you mind if I kind of pass the mic around, let people say something that they might feel they want to get off their chest and see if we can help mediate some of these issues to be back to being a little more of a highly functioning band like we were last year. That sounds good. And we want less beef. We're going to need to become vegetarians. <laughs> less like, yeah. beef with each other. Less beef. All right. Okay, who <laughs> wants to go first? Who's got something they want to... <sighs> Look. So you know me and Eddie... We're coming from the same city, playing this band, playing a bunch of bands, a lot of bands. And when the cameras are on, when the red light's on, we're playing. And he sounds great. He's, he sounds great, right? He sounds really, really good. Eddie, you sound really, really good. But then the red light goes off and you keep playing. You keep playing with your little reels and your rehearsal takes. You keep playing. 
And then the camera goes on and you keep playing and it goes off and you play and you never stop playing. I'm in the dressing room. I'm trying to take a nap and you don't stop playing. I'm trying to sleep because we're working here eight hours a day and you keep playing. I hear him in my sleep. I see him in my dreams. He never stops playing. Stop playing. Okay. I need you to stop playing. Okay. Okay. Every guy. Stop playing. All right, guys. All right. Whoa. All right, John. We, We feel you, John. Okay, I think John needs a little love. He needs a little love. It's cool. Yeah, it's cool. But yeah. what's your name, dear? My name's Eddie. Eddie. Yeah. Eddie needs some love, too. There's a reason why he feels like he has to play so much. Now, this is a serious situation here because we're on polar opposites. He wants to play more because that improves his skill and makes him that great player you're talking about. But then you need some peace. Huh? I need my peace. Because even when you're sleeping, he's playing. All day. Wow. All day. Okay. Let's bring it down. Let's bring it down a notch. Can you rephrase that complaint with a little less emotion? Okay. Take a breath. Here you go. There you go. When you do this, right. I feel, that. it makes me feel. Right. When you play. All day long, all night long. It makes me angry. So angry. Wow, there's a lot of emotion there, Eddie. I mean, I don't have patience for this. This is what I... Okay, 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 guys. This is what I do. This is what I do. This is what I do. I play. We have a lot of emotion behind that, what you shared with us.
came as soon as I heard. Where is the child? Right through here. Please come in, Doctor. Hello, Felix. My name is Dr. Collins. Felix, do you know what tone this is? D sharp. Oh. Very good, Felix. And uh, well, just a moment ago, when I rang the doorbell. A sharp, F sharp. Very good, Felix. May I speak with you candidly? Of course, of course, Doctor. <laughs> it's more serious than I thought. Your son's pitch, it's absolutely perfect. Oh my god. What, what, what does that mean? It means your son can tell what note any sound is simply by hearing it. <laughs> He's different. He's special. What will the other children say? Well, probably nothing at first. But in time, he will become more and more annoying. What, what do you mean? At first, your son's condition will be seen as a novelty, a conversation starter, icebreaker. But eventually, they will come to resent him. You see, when a person can tell the note of any sound simply by hearing it, they can't help but tell everyone around them. <laughs> Every wind chime, every car horn, every beep, every bloop. You'll know what note it is. And he will tell them. Maybe this is a good thing. Maybe, maybe like a special skill or something. Not unless he becomes a musician. And even <laughs> then, perfect pitch does not guarantee success. There is no discernible advantage or application for your son's affliction. It is completely and utterly useless! Air sharp! Enough, young man! Please forgive my outburst. I didn't even know Thunder had a page. Yeah, I feel I've overstayed my welcome. If your son becomes too much of an burden, air, please take my card. I run a special school for special children upstate. It isn't much, but at least there he would be safe. He will be around others. Others like him. Others like us. d -flat! Hey everyone, Corey Wong here. Squeezify is the sponsor of this <coughs> season. <coughs> Squeezify is... Squeezify is a great company. They're totally awesome. I love what they do. <coughs> what, I literally, I, I just said, you're a great company. <coughs> That's what the contract said I was supposed to. Buy a subscription to Squeezify to support this show. <coughs> Thanks. We good? <coughs> this show's not gonna run anymore. <coughs> 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 What's happening, Internet? That was a song about getting a real job, whatever that means. We don't know. <laughs> this is Sierra Hall. We self-criticize about what our art is and what it means, because it's our art, but it's also our profession. You've been doing this since you were like eight years old, 10 years old professionally? Well, I started playing when I was eight. Okay. Yeah, I started playing when I was eight and, you know, had some cool opportunities at a young age to sort of kind of start doing it and, and playing out at a really young age, you know. Let me interpret that for those of you who are not used to somebody speaking so humbly. <laughs> you were presented some opportunities, <laughs> meaning she was really freaking awesome at the mandolin <laughs> well, at a young age, and you started playing gigs 
And you released an album at 10 years old? Well, I did. I, that doesn't mean it was good, but <laughs> I did. <laughs> well, for people were hiring you and you were putting <laughs> out music. Yeah. I was really eat up with it from the beginning. You know, it's like I pretty much knew from the moment I picked up the mandolin at eight that that's what I wanted to do with my life. And I've never really, really imagined doing anything else since that time, which is kind of an interesting thing to be able to find your passion and, and the thing that you just, you know, really want out of life I'm so young so i feel super fortunate to have got such an early start with it all how did your family feel about you saying this is what i do what i want to do for a living they were awesome about it yeah i mean my dad um loves music in general and you know i grew up playing bluegrass music so yeah my dad actually bought a mandolin and started trying to learn to play before i even got interested in it mm. so i think he was just stoked that i <laughs> that i wanted to do it and so you know he, he believed me when I said, both my parents did, when I said, this is what I want to do. So they, you know, they definitely encouraged me to really work hard and stick with it. And I remember one time my dad telling me when I was about 10, you know, I'd been playing a couple years and I had, I'd been learning a whole lot, but I remember him saying something to me like, you know, right now you already know enough that if you just want to play and have fun for the rest of your life till you're an old lady you've already learned tons of fiddle tunes you can go to jams you can improvise a little bit but like also right now you're 10 years old and you sound like you're 10 years old and everybody goes oh wow look at that cute little girl playing the mandolin isn't she great and he said but if you don't continue to get better one day you're going to wake up and be 16 and you'll still sound like that and nobody's going to care and then if you don't keep working at it, one day you'll be 25, you know? So yeah. he basically was like, if you just want to do this for fun, you're good. You don't really have to, you know, you can just kind of yeah. learn a little bit here and there and that's cool. But like, if you really want it, you're going to have to work hard. So I was grateful that he was so like real about it at, yeah. a, at an early age. I think it always made me go, okay, yeah, I got to keep practicing. got to keep working hard to try to be my best, you know? So did you do formal training? No, I mean, growing up uh, where I did, I grew up in uh, rural Tennessee and all my early experiences with, with music really were just in church, hearing hymns. My dad played guitar a little bit. My yeah. brother and I sang and then going to local bluegrass jams. And then I got kind of bit by the bluegrass bug and started yeah. trying to learn all the fiddle tunes. And it was just all totally by ear or, you know, somebody at a jam showing me something. CDs, yeah. <laughs> listening, a lot of listening and a lot of uh, wonderful people, local musicians who maybe weren't even like stellar players per sure. se, but like that, that I did learn a lot from just yeah. being around it so much. You play so clean. When you first sent me tracks, I was like, oh, these have to be edited. When we did this demo, you were playing over Zoom and I was like, oh, dang it. She really is that good. Oh. <laughs> And I remember when we were writing over Zoom and you're playing and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that is some of the cleanest playing I have ever heard. And oh. not, that, not that I hadn't heard clean mandolin playing before, but I feel like the younger mandolin players, some of the younger bluegrass players have a different precision, have a different evenness to the playing that I'm wondering, is that a generational thing? Is it just different camps? Definitely, as as the generations have gone on, there's been more players. Like, I remember hearing, you know, I sort of did the, the backwards move from, as far as mandolin, you know, you have people that, like, start with Bill Monroe and, you know, who's really the reason why anybody in bluegrass picks up the mandolin. He sure. played the mandolin known as the father of bluegrass and like, you know, his style was very kind of rock and roll and raw and, you know, a lot of downstrokes, fast tremolo and, and yeah. strummy stuff. And so then you get into like, you know, skip ahead to, you know, my generation, there are a lot of people playing very clean individual notes and things like that. And I yeah. do think across generations, it's gotten more and more like that. But I think for me, I didn't start with Bill Monroe because he passed away before I ever got to see him play sure. live. So the, the people I was listening to when I first picked up the mail and uh, became a big Allison Krauss and Union Station fan, a guy yeah. named Adam Steffi was yep. one of the early yeah. clean mandolin players that I remember being like, whoa, now that, I like how that sounds. That's really interesting. And then, you know, Chris Thiele getting yep. that first Nickel Creek record and hearing somebody like Chris play. And so, I think I've personally had so much influence from those people because they're the people that I've actually 
had in my time to yeah. listen to and admire. And, and so, you know, I found myself, since I started there, kind of going backwards and at times going, okay, now how do I get more grit in my playing? And yeah, how do yeah. I like, you know, take that and work backwards? And so finding myself going back and really listening to Bill Monroe and learning what I can learn from that. So it's, it's interesting. You have people that sort of either start in the more gritty and kind of work their way toward clean or, or maybe just never do stylistically. Sure. But, yeah, yeah. but I know for a lot of people in my generation, it's such a sound, you kind of work your way backwards a little bit. But it's interesting because it's maybe more universal than I thought, because I think in the music that we play normally, the funk, the R&B world, the more, I mean, pop is kind of in the middle of what, you know, we can all lean into all those things, I sure. guess, in, in our genres. But it feels like growing up as somebody in a grid generation, it definitely shows in the way that many of us feel time. And I wonder if also some of the more modern players are just used to hearing music on the grid. It's ingrained in us now. Like I am much more a grid guitar player than a lot of my predecessors or whatever. It was interesting to kind of recognize that as I did the deep dive into the lineage of mandolin players. Yeah, definitely. I, d I just think especially in a, a more traditional setting of bluegrass, you know, it's like when people go in the studio, they rarely cut to a click track. But it, it really depends, you know, in some settings you do and things yeah. are trying to be very precise because it's kind of the modern world we live in sure. of yeah. recording and creating music and performing and all that. Um, but I always thought, you know, it's also one of the really fun things about acoustic music and especially music without drums and with mandolin kind of playing that role mm -hmm. in the acoustic band is that, you know, there are really exciting moments where the whole band really leans forward almost to the point of rushing yeah, in yeah. the song and then it really pulls back and, you know, yeah. definitely has a lot of room to breathe. So, you know, it's been interesting for me as I've gotten into other styles of music and playing that I find myself going, okay, just like lay back just a little bit because yeah. it's a, a type of music that's so on the front typically. Yeah. But that's also cool about playing on the grid and recognizing that, having the awareness. Absolutely, yeah. Like, okay, we're playing, we're using the click track, but it's like a, just a pulse. Totally. And we push, we pull, we lock right on it. But if you can breathe with the metronome, I think it can be That's the goal. still be very musical. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Do you record your music with a metronome? It depends on what it is. You know, yeah. for me, it's usually more of a song by song basis. Typically, like my last few albums, anything that's like full band tracking, usually not. Um, yeah. We might do multiple takes and then be able to sort of, you know, find similar tempos and, and sure. stuff like that. With my latest project, some of the tracks we started with just mandolin mm. and and built. So what I would do, I worked with this great engineer here in Nashville named Shawnee Gandhi, and I would go in and play and sing the song just completely live without a click, and she would sort of map out where my live tempos, so if there were sections in the song that felt like they needed to lean forward, like an yeah. instrumental section that just needed a little bit more gas, but then a vocal section that breathed more if you laid back. Um, we created like moving clicks. Ah, cool. And then, you know, it felt natural to play with because yeah. that's how I was used to filling the song. And so then we would kind of start there and have a, have a click, but you really had to be using your ear to sort of like follow the slight little yeah. section changes. <laughs> Which was new, I'd never done that before, yeah. but I thought that was a really interesting way to sort of bridge the gap between being able to have consistent takes, but also let them have a little bit of breathing room and, and yeah. life. Somebody just blew my mind the other day saying that they were playing with Pat Metheny and Pat Metheny likes to have a click that ramps up a little bit throughout the song, just kind of a constant. Whoa. Because that's how he feels that. And I've never noticed that. It's an arc, that. huh? Yeah. That's cool. I still have yet to test that. But <laughs> you don't uh, know I trusted their yeah, word. But yeah. I was just so like, really? That's cool. But that makes sense as far as a breathing click. I, I do that sometimes where it's maybe the chorus is 2 BPM faster and the verse is 2 BPM. It can make such a difference, yeah. really. I'm, especially as a, a singer, you mm -hmm. know, there's sometimes where it's like, if you're singing where it's comfortable and trying to like convey everything in a relaxed nature, but then the instrumental sections can just feel a little tame, you know? Yeah. And then sometimes just even a beat or two can yeah, totally. <laughs> really bring a lot of life to a yeah, song, yeah. so yeah. yeah. My first experience with your music was a song that you were singing, and I didn't even know that you were a mandolin player. Oh. Because I, I was, it was just random, we were listening to something, I was like, oh, that song is really cool. I like that. 
Then fast forward a little bit and Eddie Barbash was like, you got to check out this mandolin player that I've been playing with. She is insane. <laughs> I was like, yeah, uh, show me. We were starting to listen through some of the stuff. And I was like, wait a minute, that's, this is a song that I already heard. Ah. So it was, it was from a different, we started listening to some of your catalog. You're a singer, you're a mandolin player, you're a songwriter. What do you think you bring to the table that's most compelling? Well, I think most people think of me as a mandolin player first and foremost. Yeah. But I do think that songwriting and, and the singer-songwriter part of myself has been the thing that in recent years I've really tried to lean into more because yeah. it's, it's sort of one of those things where, you know, I grew up playing all this amazing music that ha already has this rich catalog of uh, songs that everybody knows and yep. learns, but there's not a lot of women that are the singers in that, yeah. that situation, especially when you go back to like the first generation bluegrass people. You got Bill yep. Monroe and the Stanley Brothers and, you know, Flatt and Scruggs and, and all this great music that everybody's learned from. And they sing in all these keys that the banjo sounds killer in and I need to sing in like E flat. <laughs> sure. Know? Yeah. yeah. And so, so oftentimes <laughs> in all the jams, and I'm totally fine. It's one of my favorite things in the world to just be a harmony singer and occasionally yeah. sing lead, but you know, it was a lot of that. And and I feel like that really helped strengthen my instrumental chops and harmony chops and all that stuff. But I've always written songs, but there kind of came a time where I just sort of felt like, you know, in order to really talk about the things I want to talk about or convey the things that I want to convey in my music, I felt mm -hmm. this need to have to write some of my own music. And yeah. it wasn't like I was just like, I think I'm going to be a songwriter. It just sort of like really became part of, of where my heart was, you know? Yeah. And so I think I've really felt driven to sort of work on that part sure. of, of my artistry in the last few years and just try to hopefully be somebody that can sing, play, and write. I mean, I want to totally. be able to do all those, yeah. all those things is well as I possibly can. I feel like your last album, 25 Trips, really showcased that in a new way. Thanks, I appreciate that. At least when, I, when I'm interpreting, here's the catalog, I listen through and I hear shredding mandolin, incredible mandolin, and then it kind of gradually gets into other stuff. And now this album feels like, oh, this is exploring a new space. Was that the intention with that album? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I made, my first couple records are pretty much using the bluegrass instrumentation. They're yeah. not like super traditional. They're yeah, yeah, still, yeah. you know, within that contemporary bluegrass world, but, you know, made those in my teens. And then I got to work with Bela Fleck on an album called Weighted Mind. And, mm -hmm. and you know, he, he really challenged me on that record to take these songs that I had written and work on solo mandolin vocal arrangements of the songs. Yeah. And I think growing up always playing in bands or always being surrounded by other instruments and feeling like it's such a shared type of music where you get your solo for 30 seconds or you might kick off a song and then, you know, there's kind of this systematic kind of way of doing things, you know, yeah. the banjo might kick off the song and then the fiddle might fill behind this verse or whatever mm -hmm. and there's a chorus and I just found as I was writing songs my songs weren't coming out as bluegrass songs because I love all kinds of music so there yeah. was you know a lot of other influence and just the melodies and things and gave me a good opportunity to explore that and having him encourage me to do it solo really yeah. sort of changed my perspective on how I treated my instrument in relation to my voice and, and yeah. thinking about playing different kind of lines or, or even composing lines to play while singing at the same time and stuff like that. So fast forward from that album to 25 Trips, I think I wanted to still take that approach of the singer-songwriter, sure. vocal and mandolin or guitar or octave mandolin, whatever instrument yeah. I was playing to try to like weave the things together, but then be able to add in instruments that I hadn't typically used. So it's really my first album having drums on there, or yeah. electric guitar, or piano, things like that. So it was kind of fun to sort of start to explore a little bit and putting more things back into the music from that sort of more stripped down solo mandolin voice yeah. world that I had been in for a little bit with the previous record. Do you feel like the people that were really into you as a bluegrass player were disappointed to hear that? No, what's really funny is I think there was part of me that wondered how they would feel about, especially like yeah. with when the Weighted Mind album came out, it was me playing mandolin, octave mandolin, singing, 
and then this great bassist named Ethan Yojevitz. Yeah. Uh, so it was pretty much just mandolin and bass and voice yeah. for most of the record. And I kind of thought, man, I wonder like, if the traditionalists are going to be like, where's the banjo or where's yeah, that's the what I was wondering on this. But you know what's so funny is I felt more supported by the bluegrass community on this record than any record I had made up until that point. Because cool. people know if you're doing something out of honesty or yeah. if you're just like yeah, yeah, yeah. doing something else for some other motive, I think. I don't know, I got a lot of encouragement from from even that community and you know, I thought it was uh, encouraging to just experience that. And I yeah. think kind of helped me moving forward to even just lean into it even more and try yeah. to not worry so much about where it ends up genre-wise, because I'm not really sure where you would put my last album genre-wise, per se, yeah, but yeah. because there's so many influences kind of going into it, but I feel like at the end of the day, if I'm doing my best to like follow my muse and instincts and, and heart, you know, and trying to do something in an honest way, hopefully people, even if it's not their cup of tea, can yeah. appreciate that. It's just undeniable musicality, too. If people are into that, sort of thing, if that's what they're looking for, like cool musical things on the mandolin, they're still gonna get that too. Definitely, know. yeah, keeping the mandolin in there, you yeah. know, so there's, there's still lots of mandolin yeah. to be had. Absolutely. You are one of the nicest people I've met in my life. Oh man, well, <laughs> the feeling is mutual. <laughs> you are one of the, the kindest people and easygoing. So when I think about what happens when we release ourselves to the wolves, that is, the internet and people's opinions on the internet <laughs> and their criticism of us in our art and how we interpret that as either personal or artistic, whatever. Do you have many haters? You gotta have haters at this point. I think everybody has haters, whether we think we do or not. <laughs> there's probably do you recognize more, there's your haters? There's probably you... more out there than, than we even think. Okay, you do know? you read the comment threads? I do sometimes, yeah. Yeah, I definitely do. How do you I reconcile I keep up quite that? a bit on my social media. You know, it's like I am, I'm of the generation, you know? Yeah, I'm, totally. I'm in it and yeah. I'm on it. I think there has to be a balance, you know? I've gotten better at just letting stuff roll and, yeah. you know, kind of laughing it off. I mean, like, yeah, talking about, you know, don't read the comment threads, you know? It's like, just go on any number of my YouTube videos. I'm sure there's some really hilarious stuff from, one, one of my favorites was um, one just this past year that I just, I laughed till I cried. Somebody was like, it's obvious. Okay, Mr. Hull. They were like saying, there's no way with like the length of your fingers and like, you know, they told me I had an Adam's apple that uh, that, really? that like no woman could play that way. No They basically way. were saying that no woman could play that oh, way, so this was man. obviously just a dude. <laughs> and I was, that, one, that one really, sometimes they're funny. Sometimes they're so ridiculous they're just funny, but you know, sometimes they sting a little, of course. Yeah, you know? I mean, but I mean that, if you're that, a human, one is, that one is multi-tiered. It's multi-tiered, it's you know, that's... so ridiculous. But I was like, okay, Mr. Hall. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, people. People got too much time on their hands, you know, yeah. so. Do you engage with people on the internet when they criticize you? Rarely. Yeah, rarely. I usually just try to like, just let what it would, be. Let what it would, be. What would it be that would make you engage? Because I have a pretty strict DNE. Do not engage. And I tell the same yeah. thing for the members of the band. Like, look, if yeah. there are people that are coming at you about something that we did or whatever, just... Don't, I mean, if it's a direct message, that's maybe one thing because they're actually reaching out yeah. personally. And, you know, I get a lot of, you suck, you <laughs> use the same tone, whatever, <laughs> you know. Because as a guitar player, I'm expected to have a bunch of, like, to play different tones. Like, I imagine w when you play the mandolin, like, she uses the same mandolin patch on every... Oh. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, it's a mandolin. With the guitar, I'm like, <laughs> it's a guitar. Anyways, I have a pretty strict DNE, but there's rare occasions where I say... Uh, I gotta step in. What is that for you? I rarely do. I think, like, you can criticize my music all you want, because that's, you know, that's total opinion. But yeah. I think if somebody's saying something that's just completely false about my character or something, which mm -hmm. I've not had happen that much, but that's probably when I would step in and be like, look, you know, no. Totally. <laughs> you know, that, that gets a little more personal, yeah. you know. 
Like I if there's something the somebody's just saying about me that's completely not true or whatever, yeah. you know, unmusic related, that's maybe a different story. But yeah, I mean, when it comes to criticizing music, it's like, you know, there's no way every single person in the world is gonna like every single thing we do. So I think yeah. the sooner we can just accept that and try to like plow forward and just do our thing and, you know, be grateful for all the people that do like what you're working on, you know? And, yeah. um, and not let that be the thing that steers your motivation for making music totally. at the end of the day. The comment that somebody said, there's no way a woman could play like that. Obviously that's so ridiculous <laughs> and multi-tiered. But do you feel like you get criticized differently being a woman playing music in general, but the mandolin and the type of music that you do? I've not encountered it as much as some. You know, I feel like bluegrass, you know, growing up in that world um, is such a small kind of sector of music anyway. Sure. Um, and I mean, yeah, I mean, growing up, I didn't have a lot of, a lot of female mandolin heroes. I mean, basically none. They were yeah. all men. And, but I got to meet most of them when I was really young and never had a time or a crazy, I mean, I never had a bad experience with any of the people I truly loved their mm -hmm. music, you yeah, know? Yeah. And, and I'm super grateful that I can say that wholeheartedly, that they've just been so um, supportive and encouraging ever since I was, you know, a little kid. And so I don't think I ever thought too much about it until I even got a little older and started realizing you know, as we all kind of do, I think, in this, this time we're living in where you're sort of a little bit more aware of, you know, the space we occupy in, in our scenes and mm -hmm. what that means. And I feel really fortunate, I guess, yeah. that I've, I've had, you know, some pretty wonderful experiences rather than, you know, can point to some, like, things where I feel like I've not felt accepted or sure. whatever. There's also things that I'm sure, like, work in the other way, too, where... You know, because I'm a woman, maybe there's some things that might stand out and, and be for the good, too, where somebody, like, yeah. notices, you know, in a way that maybe if I was just a dude, they might not. So, I don't know. It's like, I think it kind of works both ways, depending yeah. on how you look at it. When I'm at home watching music videos with my kids, my daughter's like, ooh, I like that band. That's the band with the girl who plays bass. And then the next day I notice, she went down and picked up the bass guitar. I think, oh, interesting. I wonder if that has anything to do, it's got to. Uh, my friend Dave Cause has this show he did with the Summer Horns and we went and saw this show and it was this amazing show and the trombone player is this incredible trombone player, Aubrey Logan. She's crushing on trombone and she's singing and afterwards my youngest on the way home says, I wanna play trombone. It's so like, great. Oh, interesting. That has to mean something and it does and I can see it. Absolutely. Do you feel like you hold a certain ambassador role for girls who want to pick up the mandolin? I do, yeah. Um, not that that's like, you know, that I'm thinking, oh, I'm like worthy of that position. Sure, sure, but, sure. But I do think that naturally, just, you know, there haven't been as many women to look to. And yeah. so I definitely have all kinds of young girls and things like that that come up to me at shows and festivals. and Or, you know, my daughter started playing mandolin and like it's so great that we can show her a video of you and and yeah. I do think it matters I mean I remember seeing um there's a a lady um very well-known lady in the, the bluegrass world named Rhonda Vincent um who's primarily known as a, a singer but mm -hmm. she plays mandolin too never really was much of a, a lead player every now and then she would take a solo but I just remember seeing her on the cover of an album when I was little and it it dawned on me I was probably you know nine or 10 at that point, I'd already been playing and listening to Sam Bush and all, you know, David Grisman and all these like cool players and not even really thinking about it. I was just stoked and everybody at the jam welcomed me. It wasn't yeah. like, I'm a girl. But I remember seeing her holding a mandolin on the cover of an album. And I, I, I so clearly remember looking at it and going, whoa, that's gonna, that's what I'm gonna look like someday. I'm yeah. gonna be a grown woman playing mandolin, making albums, and, and it was just like seeing yourself in someone. Yeah. I think representation does really matter in that way that, yeah. that, you know, sometimes seeing something allows us to believe it's possible That's for ourselves, you know? I don't think there's anywhere to go from there. That's beautiful. That's <laughs> one of the best mandolin players in the world. 
one of my favorite musicians, Sierra Hall. Thanks, Corey. <laughs> Big thanks to Sierra Hall for hanging out with us. We've got some things we've got to work through this week, our own inner criticism, and I hope you can work out your issues as well. See you in the comment threads. Two, three. <laughs>